Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. Today I've got a very exciting product I'd like to introduce to you. And this is it here. It's called the Benro Polaris. And it's a multi-functional device. It's a star tracker, it's an automated panorama maker, and it also shoots time-lapse. Now, this being an all-in-one device does introduce a number of uh, well, interesting features, and I'm going to get onto that in a minute. So the question is, why would I need another Star Tracker? I mean, let's face it, I've got them coming out my ears here, and all of these devices, which I have used and do use, are excellent at Star Tracking. So, why this one? Why the Benro Polaris? Well, you know, there's really only one reason why I bought this unit. And let me tell you, this thing cost me an arm and a leg. It is far more expensive than all of these other trackers. But the reason I bought it was simply to do automated tracked panoramas. That's right, tracked panoramas, that's it. Do I need this unit to do just standard star tracking? No, I do not because these units do it probably better than this. And the other thing about these units is they are way cheaper. This thing, well, it's about 2,000 Australian dollars. Now that is an enormous amount of money just for one device. And for me, you know, I think comparing it to these other trackers, these are easier to, in my mind, easier to set up because I've had a few issues with this. I'm gonna elaborate on that. Uh, but they, they track better than this. Having said that, for what I want it for, which is tracked panoramas, shooting typically at one minute, sometimes two minute shutter speeds, this thing does okay. And I'm gonna show you some examples and we'll go through some of the things. Now this is only really an initial video about this unit. Uh, perhaps I'll do some more in-depth things as we go through and as I get more experience using it. I've been using it now for a, a fair while and I've done a lot of images with it. Uh, and I'm going to go through those in a minute. So who do you think would benefit most from this unit? Well, I think, to be honest with you, it is not beginners. People who are new to star tracking or new to photography or new to nightscape photography, this could introduce nightmares into your life because you know it has for me on a couple of occasions. Uh, and I, I think these other trackers are far far easier to get a handle on and to get you up and running. For example, this Star Adventure Mini is still my favorite tracker. It is just an amazing, look at the size of it. It weighs about a quarter of what the Polaris weighs. It costs about a quarter of what, probably less than a quarter. And it just is, does a fantastic job. But anyway, I'm not gonna elaborate more on that just yet. Um, so it, this is not a beginner's device unless you are a person who loves gadgets and loves fiddling and loves experimenting and loves working things out. Now, a lot of photographers are like that. They're very technical in the way that they approach things. And so a device like this that has got a lot of little quirks and idiosyncrasies may well suit you. But if you're a person who is more of a creative thinker and you just want to get out there and take photos and you want to do a bit of star tracking, then I would strongly suggest you don't look at this unit first up. Have a look at these other units here because they are far simpler, easier to use. Some of the questions that people will ask is how accurate is the tracking? Okay, so I'm gonna show you some examples of the tracking that I've done with this unit now, and that'll give you a little bit more of a picture. So here is an image I took just as a test shot. It is at 20 millimeter focal length, 30 second shutter speed, ISO 3200. It's on a Z6 Astro modified camera. If I zoom in, you can see it's actually pretty good. The tracking on this looks okay to me, but it should be at 30 seconds. I can't see any reason why that wouldn't be. So I did a number of tests as the night progressed. And you can see here, I'll show you the final panorama in a minute, but I did shoot panos. And these ones are a different setting. So these are 60 seconds, ISO 1600. Zoom in a little bit on these ones and you can see they look pretty good as well. I don't have a problem with any of the tracking here, as you'd imagine. There was a little bit of mist around, so potential for a bit of haziness, but uh, the actual image I, I love. Really, really good. Now, further on in that night, I tried a 50 millimeter lens, and let's just have a look at a 50 mil one. I was really impressed with this. So that's a one minute shutter speed, 
ISO 1600 at f2.8, 50 millimeters. Again, Astro modified camera. Zoom in so you can see that's a beautiful image. Really nice. This is completely unedited at this point, just straight out of the camera. It looks really, really nice. So this image down here has two minute shutter speed. And uh, I've just done a little bit of white balance adjustment on this, but nothing else. You can see there's no sliders moved. So this is at two minutes at 50 millimeters. And again, that's not looking too bad. I can't see any massive obvious trailing in that. So that's good. 50 millimeter focal length. So you can't argue with that. So I shot a number of panos, but that, that's the panorama I shot with a 50 millimeter lens. There's about eight shots in that. I'll have to look it up, but uh, that looks phenomenal. Absolutely beautiful. And this is all shot with the Benro Polaris. Lots and lots of detail in that core. 50 millimeters, these are one minute shutter speeds. And yeah, it, it, it stitched together beautifully. In a minute, I'll show you the final with the foreground attached, but that looks great, love it. So what we're looking at here is my first attempt at a tracked panorama. And this one is, you can see the setting 60 seconds at f4.5. It was a fairly heavy moon, so I had to drop my settings a lot. And if you zoom in, you can see that the stars look pretty good, uh, but the foreground is blurry because this is actually a tracked pano. So the foreground blurs, but it's still stitched together okay. Uh, not that I'm going to use that as a foreground, but I took something like 15 or 16 photos. So I think it was two rows of eight to get this happening. It worked perfectly as a panorama. Now, a bit further on in that same night, I decided to do a panorama that wasn't tracked and you can see the results. These are the images, a few of the individual shots that I took down the bottom here. And you can see there uh, a 25 second shutter speed at F4, ISO 800. So you can see that the foreground is not going to be blurred. It's in focus quite nicely, as is the sky. So I just blended all of those together into this final image here. And I think this one looks absolutely phenomenal. I'll just go full screen on that so you can have a good look at it. That, by the way, that's a contrail, an airplane that went across the frame that you can see there. But this is a really nice panorama image. And again, there's about 16 shots there. So I think it's two rows of eight, 20 millimeter focal length. And it looks fantastic. I mean, there's a lot of moonlight, but the moonlight has actually lit the foreground quite nicely. And I, I think that image looks really, really good. So that's a shot that I love. Now, after that, I decided to go out on a dark, moonless night. So you can see this image here. This is shot at 35 millimeter focal length, ISO 1600, 60 second shutter speed at f2.8. This is completely unedited. So if I zoom in a little bit on this image, you can see that the stars are nice and round. No great issue there. This is a 35 millimeter Nikon lens, a little bit of uh, coma in the corners on this lens. So out of all my Z lenses, this is probably the worst, but that's the tracking performance is excellent. As you can see here, the stars are really good. This is a 60 second. So this is pointing sort of towards the South Celestial Pole. So it's probably not a fair test in, the, in that there's less movement in that part of the sky here in the Southern Hemisphere. So I decided to point it towards the North, which gives uh, more star movement. This is a two minute shutter speed, 35 millimeter ISO 800 f2.8. Uh, just a little bit of editing on this one just to change it, but you can see the difference between the original shot on the left and the edited one on the right. Not, not too much difference, a beautiful air glow in the sky this night. And um, I'll zoom in on this one. Remember, this is a two minute shutter speed. Ah, oh, it looks like a satellite trail right through the middle of it there. So the stars look pretty good in this one too. Remember, two minute shutter speed. Not too bad. And you can see a little bit of that coma in the corners there, but that's that's all right. That's what you'd expect as we move through the image. It looks pretty good. So I'm very happy with that. So this is just a single frame from the Benro Polaris at 35 millimeters. Then I decided to try a few other images. So here's a shot of the Milky Way. Again, completely unedited, nothing done at all to this. You can see an airplane's gone right through the middle of this frame. And this is the galactic core looking almost directly overhead. It was almost straight up at this point. And you can see the beautiful galaxy there. 
looks great. This one is two minute shutter speed. Okay, so then I decided to extend my shutter speed out. So this image here is a similar composition, but this is three minute shutter speed, still at 35 millimeter focal length. So this is three minutes on the Benro Polaris. And you can see there in the middle of the frame, looks good, nice and round. Uh, and even up towards the top, yep. A bit of coma as I suggested, but that's fine. I'd be happy with that. Three minute shutter speed. Remember, this is just a single star alignment and moving more away from the South Celestial Pole. So then I tried a four minute shutter speed, which is the next one. Uh, and this one isn't too bad either. Let's just have a look at it. So once again, you can see Antares there and uh, the Roafuki complex here. That looks nice and round. I reckon that doesn't look bad at all. Now, if you look really closely here, I think you can see that there's a beginning of a little bit of trailing. To be honest, at 100% uh, looking at it, but you know, gee, it's not too bad still. I don't reckon. And you can see there, the, the big stars look round, like that one. Doesn't look too badly trailed at all. And certainly in the center of the frame, uh, it's pretty good, but you know, generally I'm not going to be shooting just at four minute shutter speeds, but that's just an example to show you what results you can get. Now this is 35 millimeter focal length. So I've showed you 20 mil, 35 and 50 mil, and it's performed very well. Now I want to show you some multi-row tracked panoramas that I did in the past couple of weeks on nice, dark, clear skies. And here's the first one. This is a four shot 20 millimeter tracked pano. And you can see the tree in the foreground there. And it is absolutely beautiful. Love this shot. A lot of detail. That's only four shots. There was a touch of moonlight on this night. So the, the foreground was lit by that moonlight, but the sky, absolutely gorgeous. And I really, really like that one. This next one is an eight shot tracked panorama. So this is eight shots in portrait orientation side by side. Again, moonlit on the foreground. So the foreground is shot separately from the sky because the sky is tracked and the foreground is not tracked. And I shot the foreground first and then waited for the sky to drop down over the top of the foreground. 20 millimeter, eight shot. Settings are 60 second shutter speed, ISO 1600, F2.8. Here's another one. This is a seven shot panorama of the sky and foreground, two separate panos joined together. Love this one. This is again lit by a touch of moonlight and there's a lot of detail in this shot. If you zoom in, you can see uh, the fence line, you can see the, the trees, Milky Way galactic core, absolutely gorgeous. I just love this type of shot. And here in the Southern hemisphere, when the Milky Way gets down low in that Western sky, it's really easy to take panoramas because it stretches sideways across the sky and it is absolutely beautiful. Here's the one of the image I showed you previously with a 50 millimeter focal length. I just forget off the top of my head how many shots this is, but it's about five or six of the foreground and about probably about the same of the sky. 50 millimeter focal length, a little bit of cloud on the horizon there, but that makes the blend even better. And you can see the tree there looks absolutely phenomenal. There's our detail in the sky. So if you can ever shoot longer focal lengths, do it because they are just spectacular. Look at the detail in that. Remember, this is using tracked panorama on the Benro Polaris at 50 millimeters. Ah, there we go. Now this, I love this shot. This is a two row panorama of the sky tracked on the Benro Polaris, 20 millimeter focal length. Again, 60 second shutter speeds, f2.8, ISO 1600. And then I've shot the foreground, uh, which I shot the foreground first, actually a touch of moonlight again. This is shot at about f4, I think, and uh, 15 second shutter speeds at ISO 2500. And then I've just blended the two together. But uh, there's amazing detail in this shot because there's so many images. Have a look at that, it is just gorgeous. Absolutely beautiful. So once again, the Benro has done a really good job of tracking the sky and shooting all of the shots. I didn't do anything. I just set it up on its way and made it work. And there you can see the results of beautiful Southern Hemisphere Milky Way arch.
All right, so let's just go into some of the details about setting this unit up to use. Now, one of the things that really frustrated me at the beginning was the fact that uh, when the unit is in its home position, in other words, before you turn it on, this knob here hits on the tripod. In other words, you can't screw that onto your tripod without some help. And this device here, which is also made by Benro, by the way, is designed to fix that problem. See how it's got a thinner space at the top here. So when you put this unit on top of that, you don't have the issue of this knob here coming down and hitting the tripod. It spaces it up a little bit. Now that's fine uh, and you can get around it, but it's something that's a real pain in the backside. It just slows you down when you're out in the field and I, I don't really like that. Now the biggest issue I have with my particular unit is that I have enormous amount of trouble just simply turning it on. Now you say, what? Turning it on? Just press a button. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, I'm gonna elaborate more on that in a minute. You'll see me out in the field. I'll show you exactly the problems I had with this unit. Uh, and that leads me to another thing. If you look at the Benro Polaris Facebook group, you will see countless technical issues with this unit, whether it's software based or hardware based or, or just connection issues with the phone. There are countless issues from users all around the world that Benro are working at. Now, I talked to Benro about this turning on issue and I'm still in conversation with them. They're looking at it. I've sent them a video of the problem. They haven't yet got back to me, but I know they're, they're working on it. So we'll just see how that comes up. So the other thing that's really important for this unit, because basically this works differently to all these other star trackers. It doesn't uh, line up to the North or South Celestial Pole. It's an alt azimuth tracker and it's got this extra unit built on here, which is um, an astro uh, head, I suppose they'd call it. So it gives a third axis of rotation. So this thing is moving in three different movements to keep the stars tracking. And it's, it's pretty clever, to be honest. And there's a fair bit of technology going on to get this thing to work. But in essence, it's an alt azimuth tripod head. It goes this way and it goes up and down. So uh, the initial use of this is completely different to the way these are set up. You put these up, face them towards the south or north celestial pole, polar align, and away you go. With this, it doesn't do any of that. It uses software based. Now that's another thing that uh, is often a major problem. It's, it's the concept of connection to a phone app to make it all work. Now, one of the things I dislike about a lot of gadgets, including trackers, is using mobile apps to make them work. Now, if the mobile app works, all well and good. If the mobile app won't work or it won't connect for whatever reason, you are in for a world of pain. Now, some of the users on the Facebook group just cannot get this unit to connect to their phone. I haven't had that problem at all, so I'm not gonna comment on that, but I know others have. And that's the other thing about this unit. It is very much camera specific when it comes to the issues that people come up with. So I'm shooting with Nikon cameras, so I'm gonna be talking about the issues I may have had with that. Other people shooting Sony or Canon might be fine with that, but they might have something else. The reality is everyone has some sort of issue with this. And uh, that's a bit of a problem for a $2,000 uh, device. One of the big issues that everyone faces is calibrating the phone. So basically you have to make sure you calibrate your phone with the GPS and the compass inside the phone to line it up. Now I'll show you out in the field in a minute, but uh, you need your phone basically to work out where north and south is on the compass so that this device can then track. And of course, the other major thing that is so important with this unit is to get a level base on your tripod. So whatever you're sitting your device on has to be perfectly level. And that's another thing a lot of people are having trouble with, just leveling tripods. Thankfully, I'm using a, a bowl set up on my tripod. It makes it really easy just to get that fine movement without having to adjust the tripod legs. Uh, and, and look, to be honest, you have to level a base on all of these, but not to the level of uh, exactness that you need for the Benro uh, Polaris. The other thing that I have a problem with on the Nikon is screen blackout. So when I connect the USB cable from this device into my Nikon Z6 
or Z6 Mark II or Z7 or Z8 or Z, it doesn't matter which Z series, they're all the same, is that the actual screen of the camera blacks out and you're then forced to use the phone screen to see what's going on. Now, that works okay for some things and for other things it's no good. For example, focusing, I cannot focus using that. I just can't see well enough. The resolution just is not there. So I need the back screen. So you can put the app into what they call shutter mode. And shutter mode is actually quite handy because it takes away the connection with the uh, app to a degree so that you can then view the screen on the back of the camera. It works well. You can actually focus doing that. But a, a, a bit of a quirk I found with my Nikons is I can't actually preview my images that I've just taken. So like I said, there's a lot of issues with this device that if you're a beginner, you're gonna struggle with this stuff big time. Uh, now other users, for example, Sony users don't have this issue. You can see the screen at the same time as the app and that works pretty well. I think Canon users, if you just shuttle between shutter mode and the other mode, you can actually adjust to see your uh, preview of your picture. So it just depends on the brand of camera you're using. Now, I must tell you, I'm basically using wide angle lenses, 20 mil, 35, I did use 50, I did try 85 millimeter, but the 85 millimeter I didn't get good results with as far as tracking accuracy. But anything up to 50 mil I found to be pretty good. So uh, that's all I'm really interested in. There's no way known I would try a telephoto lens on this device. I don't think it's suitable. I don't think it's gonna be accurate. You're gonna get very short exposures. I don't see the point. You're much better off with one of these other trackers. At least you can put counterweights on and you can actually extend the focal lengths way out. Uh, this, I wouldn't even bother. This is for wide angle shooting in my opinion. And I think it does that okay. So as mentioned, I bought this unit for tracked panorama shooting. And for that purpose, this thing's a breeze. You set it up and let it run its course. It does it all by itself. And then you can go and have a cup of tea. You can go and have a rest. You can go and lay down. And that is the reason I love this device for automated tracked panoramas. It gives me time back. Rather than sitting there adjusting the tracker every time you've taken a shot and moving it to the next frame, this thing does it automatically. And I think it does it pretty well, I'm gonna take you out in the field and show you a somewhat interesting user experience. Okay, so out here in the field, the very first thing that I'm going to do is level the tripod base here. Now you will notice I've got my little spirit level, which I showed you previously, which I put on top of the tripod here, and I've got a bowl tripod. Now I've showed you this bowl tripod so it means I can move the centre column around anywhere I want to. So this is a two-way caravan bubble level. I'm going to stick that on there and just turn that around like that and then once that's on there that's a block, a nylon block with a thread in it so it sticks on top of a tripod. From there I'm going to change the bottom here and level those two bubbles together let's see how that goes and from there we get the Polaris unit itself and we screw it on the top now it does actually have on the bottom a slot for an Arca Swiss plate but I wouldn't recommend using that because that's just another area that can potentially go out of level if you don't place it exactly right so I'm just going to screw it on top of this base and we'll go from there uh, there we go now you can see, if you have a close look at this, you will see that the unit is not, let me just turn that off, you can see that the unit is not in its parked position. So when I say the parked position, that means a storage position. Uh, and with this little Benro plate, it will fit in that park position, but many tripods, it just won't, because it's just not compatible with wide bases on tripods. So if it's in that park position, uh, this knob here hits the tripod. You've got to push it up. Now this is one of the downsides of a Benro Polaris if you're not ready for that when you receive the unit. So this is what it looks like in the parked position. And you can see how close this gets to the tripod. Now, if I didn't have this spacer here, it would be touching this and there's no way now and I could actually screw that on to a standard tripod. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do is get my phone out 
And the first thing before I do anything with the Polaris unit is calibrate the compass. How do I do that? Just a great big figure eight movement of the phone. I think pretty much any phone requires a good calibration before you do any uh, alignments with it because I'm going to be using my phone here to do all of the alignment and adjustments on the unit. So that's first things first. Let's do that. Now I'm going to attempt to turn this unit on. Now I'm sure some of you are literally laughing your heads off at me right now because I'm pressing this button and nothing is happening. And I'm pressing and pressing and pressing. And what I'm doing, I'm waiting for that little green light just to flash. Because what's happened, supposed to happen is you press it once, one short press and then one long press, just like a DJI drone, and that's how you get it going. But with this particular unit, it ain't doing that. I've got to keep pressing it until I get that flash. And when I get the flash, I'll then do a long press and it will be fine. Still going. This is ridiculous. And the reason I'm looking for a light to flash is because that means it's actually going to receive a Wi-Fi signal so I can control everything from the app. And there's nothing happening. I've been here 15 minutes trying to get this working. Okay, so this is getting beyond a joke. I mean, I've been trying and trying and trying to get this to work. Now, I'm just going to illustrate the major problem I'm having here. Now, for those of you who, who fly DJI drones, you know it's a one short press and then one long press. And this unit will then go beep and then beep, beep, beep. Okay, you listen to this. Where are we? One short press, one long press. Did you hear that? Beep, beep, beep. And it's now motoring into, away from its parked position, into its normal position. But I want to show you something. There are no Wi-Fi lights. So right in here, there is supposed to be a green light, which tells me that the unit is turned on, and a blue light, which tells me that the Wi-Fi is ready for transmission. I don't have any of those lights. Okay, so to turn the unit off, normally it's just one long press of the button. So let me see what happens. And there you have it. It turned off with the beep. So the unit is turning on and turning off, but I'm not getting any lights to indicate that it's on and certainly no Wi-Fi signal. So I cannot connect my phone. Okay, so it's been 25 minutes. I've been here trying to press the buttons over there on the tripod. My neck is killing me because I've been looking up into the unit trying to get it to turn on. Now, it's never been this bad before. I've used this quite a few times and I've never had this much trouble getting it to work. I don't know why suddenly. Now, some people have reported that perhaps it's got something to do with cold weather. It is pretty cold out here, but I've had it out heaps of times in the cold weather. I'll tell you what, I know quite a few people that are using this thing as a paperweight, and I can absolutely see why that might be the case. Okay, so after 35 minutes, I finally got that beep I was looking for and it's connected no worries to the phone so for me it's never connection issues that are a problem it is just simply getting the unit to turn on properly in the first place now i'm really really frustrated because i've been here for so long i haven't shot anything i haven't even got my camera up on the tripod yet so anyway i'm just gonna calm down oh there's trucks everywhere on the highway behind me now it's all happening out here, I'll tell you what. So what I'm going to do is just organise to do a track shot. The whole purpose of being here is to demonstrate in the field how to use this unit. And I, I don't know if you're as frustrated as I am, but it is a real pain in the backside at this stage. All right, let me get the camera set up. Okay, so here we go. What I'm doing is I'm shooting with a Nikon Z6. This is a Hydrogen Alpha modified Z6 camera, Mark I. It's fitted with a Nikon 35mm f1.8 lens. Okay, so what I've done, I've connected my uh, phone app to the device and it is working fine. I can then position the device just with these little sliders on the phone. Um, one of the problems I have, because I'm shooting with a Nikon camera, you'll see... Oh, you probably can't see, but that says uh, connected to PC. So in other words, I cannot see the live view screen. It's probably trying to give me a live view view on the phone here, but the phone screen is just hopeless. I can't see anything on that very easily. So the first thing we do to actually get into our star tracking mode is click on this little camera icon at the top right hand of the screen. 
and that gives us some options here. Now I want to choose the Astro module, so I'll click that. And from there, it asks us to calibrate the phone's compass, which I've already showed you about. Then we put this up against the side of the Benro Polaris to start the calibration process. Click confirm. All right, now it's asking for a celestial position to be aligned. We need to select a star. So I click on this star shape here on the left hand side, the second from the top, and it gives me the options of stars that are visible at the time, or perhaps the sun or Venus or moon, it doesn't matter. So I'm going to choose Rigel Centaurus, which is actually Alpha Centauri here in the Southern Hemisphere. Click on that and then press go to. And from there, it will move the camera and slew it around to find that particular star. Once we get the star close to the center of that red reticle in the middle, we can double tap the left hand joystick and you'll see it expands into a opportunity for us to zoom in a little bit on that star. You can see there now that the star is bigger and then I can fine tune with smaller, more articulate movements into the center of that reticle. And once we get that star in the middle of that center reticle, all we need to do is click on confirm down in the bottom right hand side of the screen. And we are ready to go tracking. This is what's known as single star alignment. And for this unit, it does work pretty well, especially when using wide angle lenses. So you can use the up and down joystick here and the left and right, which is on the same joystick on the left hand side there. This joystick over on the right here at the moment is for the Astro unit. So when you apply that, it moves the Astro unit on top and that can give you a bit of a fine tuning of your positioning to find that star. So once we have a device tracking, as you can see down the bottom right hand side there, we can then turn our attention to the camera settings and on the top row of the phone app, you can see here, if we click on that, you can see the various settings for the shutter speed, aperture, ISO, etc. Now I've got this set to bulb mode and here in the middle, you can see I've got it set to one minute shutter speed, but I can just roll that up to whatever I want. Uh, I've set my aperture here to f 2.8 as you can see and my ISO down here to 1600 and so that's what I typically use now if I'm going to shoot say let's say I shoot two minute shutter speeds I'm going to half that ISO to 800 and from there all you do is press up on the green square and it is now taking an image and so you can see it counting down there so it's got nine seconds to go I like this I like the fact that you can keep tabs of what the camera is doing without having to worry about the camera screen at all. So that's a positive. Okay, so it's just finished taking the image. It's clicked over. It says image is being processed and it will come up with a little preview here on the screen, which I'll tap on and you can see what that looks like. That does give you the option to squeeze in and just check focus. But as you can see there, it's very blurry and hard to check the focus, but I, I think the focus is good. I checked it before on the camera screen itself and on the camera screen I trust. I do not trust the resolution of the phone screen. But other than that, that process of taking an image works quite well. All right, so I've just shot about four or five different shutter speeds using just a single frame tracker. And I went from 60 seconds, two minutes, three minutes and four minutes. And I was actually pretty happy with the results of even that four minute shot. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to do a vertical panorama just to show you how that works. And I've got this brilliant device on my camera here, which is the, the Silence Corner Atoll mount. So I can just turn it around like that. Have a look at that. I can go from portrait orientation to landscape orientation with just a very quick motion. Absolutely love that. And that suits this unit perfectly because there's no worries about fouling up any of the cables or anything like that. All right, so now to set up for panorama, what I do is click down on the bottom here and go to, I'm gonna to go to the pro mode of panorama and it's gonna ask me the parameters I wanna set. So firstly down the bottom, you can see I've set 35 millimeters. So that's good, that's what I want. Then the overlap, oh, and by the way, uh, portrait orientation, I'm not in portrait, I'm in landscape, so I've changed that. 
Uh, I'm going for a 60% overlap. I always go for a very lo long overlap. From there, it's going to ask me where I want my start position to be. So my camera's pointing down here, fairly close down to the ground. I'll just go a little bit lower than that. So I'm just controlling by using the joystick. So I press the start button and I click on that. Now it's asking me what, where I want the end point to be. So I want the end point up there. So I'm going to push the camera up. You can see it going up. Now to the top there, the Eta Carina Nebula up the top there. So let's see what we can get here. I don't know, about there. It's up into the bottom of the Milky Way galactic core there. I'm going to press end. And there we go. So it's, I don't know how many shots we're going to get there. I can't even read this. My eyes are going all blurry. It's getting cold out here. So what I'm going to do now, very simply, I just press the start button here. And see, it's gone down to the bottom. It's now waiting and it's going to start. And that's exactly how this panorama works. It's really simple. I love it. I've done quite a few successful ones previous to tonight. Let's see how this one goes. Okay, so it's just finished its first exposure. You can see the camera now moving for the second exposure. Okay, so here we go again. Let's see what it does this time. Oh, interesting. Yep, it's gone over. So it's doing a two row vertical. So it says there's seven shots remaining on the app, as you can see here. It's doing so far exactly what it's meant to be doing. Well, that was a really interesting exercise. It actually shot about 10 photos and it did two rows. Pretty happy with that performance. Once I got the thing actually turned on, it seems to be performing very well here tonight. All right, well, I think I have recovered from that experience. Man, oh man, I was frustrated there for a while. But I'll tell you what, in the end, I did get some half decent shots. So I wanna look now at the reasons why you would choose the Benro Polaris. Firstly, no need to polar align with a pole star. And that's really handy, especially if you can't see the pole star, if there's trees in the way or something like that. This unit will do it by aligning to a different star in the sky. It does, as mentioned, fully automated tracked and untracked panoramas. It's an all-in-one unit. It does panoramas, tracking, time-lapse, where for other devices, you might need two or more to do all of that. Excellent results when everything works as it should. And the other thing I like is it's got a great inbuilt intervalometer. I don't mind the interface of the app. It's easy to change the camera settings, and I think all of those things combined work pretty well. Okay, so what about the reasons not to choose the Benro Polaris? Well, this is my opinion, of course. Number one, of course, is the price. This thing is just really expensive, and a lot of people just won't want to fork out that much money, especially for an item that is not yet 100% working the way that it should. This is also not universally compatible with every camera, and that is also a major problem because you don't know what you're going to get until you start playing with the unit. The user interface and the app still need some work because so many people find themselves fighting with the device just to get basic connection and operation of the unit. So there is some software development that needs to be done, perhaps hardware as well. This is certainly not a beginner friendly device. There is also inconsistent tracking performance, sometimes even in the same session. I've noticed that quite a few times. If this is only used for single frame tracking, that's not panoramas, there are much cheaper and in my opinion, more efficient trackers on the market, particularly these ones here that I'm showing you. Uh, there's no reason to buy this just for single tracked shots, in my opinion. So anyway, that's my little introduction to the Benro Polaris. Uh, if you're one of those people that likes a little bit of uh, gadgetry and you like playing with it, so I just accidentally pressed the button. It's folding itself up now. Uh, and if you like playing with gadgets and you like something that's a bit of a challenge, this is a device for you. Oh, as long as you've got plenty of cash. But this is a great device. It's got a lot of potential, but it has its idiosyncrasies, as I've already pointed out. I'll be doing some more with this, and I'll let you know how I go as time progresses. But in the meantime, you get out there and have some great 
fun under the stars. I'll see you in the next video.